the small town of Radisson is, like most Saskatchewan towns, a farming community. Radisson, as well, for the past seven years, has harbored a thriving cottage industry. South of town dwell a family of potters, Ron and Rusty Corinda, and their son, Quinn. my family and it was very easy to to become part of it the pottery studio home is snugly built into the side of a hill overlooking the North Saskatchewan River so we built out here a log home and incorporated in our home was the studio all part and parcel Ron and Rusty create their handcraft pottery in a superbly organized environment. Their kiln shed, studio, and home are combined. This setting allows them to couple their work with their love and appreciation of the natural surroundings. Over the years, the two have uniquely combined their efforts in pottery production. Yet yeah, we do work together and have worked together uh, prior to moving out here. Uh, in fact, I did all the glazing and glaze formulation, and Rusty did the throwing on the wheel. And uh, evolution took over. Uh, Rusty taught me how to throw on the wheel, basically. And from there, she took over glazing and decorating, and I did the wheel throwing and wheel work. And all this from a kid that had problems with high school chemistry. <laughs> Consultation with each other and an awareness of what pottery pieces are needed to sell lead to production decisions. Ron is responsible for the primary process. His work involves handling the raw clay and forming it on a potter's wheel, a process referred to as throwing. He wedges the clay body and divides it into workable pieces. Each piece is centered and through a series of deliberate moves, coning, opening, drawing, and thinning, he forms a symmetrical pot. Ron's years at the wheel are evident in the speed and accuracy with which he works. He has developed a feel, an innate understanding of clay, and how he can make it do what he wants. When the throne piece has reached the desired leather hardness, Ron trims away this excess clay from the sides and bottom of the pot to give it a well-finished appearance. Upon any given occasion, Quinn, Ron and Rusty's seven-year-old son, can be found working in the clay studio alongside his parents. Clay has been a part of his life since birth. Ron and Rusty have adorned the pottery studio with many of his accomplishments. The completed pieces of pottery are dried and bisque or low-fired in an electric kiln to ready them for Rusty and her expertise. A lot of people are surprised that because we're married, how can we live and work together? And uh, it's easy uh, if you maintain a respect for your own territory, for your own space, and not invade it too often. And that way you can, and you can work together as a team. Teamwork is essential for their craft to survive. Both respect the history and tradition surrounding their craft. Rusty surveys Ron's bisqueware and transfers it to her studio for glazing. We each have our own studios. I have my own glazing studio because I'm kind of dusty and sloppy about things. And Ron wipes all the little slot marks off the walls every night. He vacuums his studio every night. He scrubs his studio every night. So I have my own little place, and um, that way we like each other a lot better. <laughs> In Rusty's well-organized space, the glazing process begins. Her studio is filled with the essentials for glaze making, from raw chemicals to scales, along with equipment for glaze application, from brushes to spray booth. Rusty mixes all of her own glazes from raw materials. A dependable, well-tested glaze recipe is chosen, and each chemical is weighed using a gram balance. As the materials are dusty and often toxic, Rusty always wears a safety mask. The dry ingredients are mixed with water to a soupy consistency, and then poured through a sieve. 
think also it's very important to understand the realm of your glazes and their limitations because the glazes will they might be listed as a cone eight or cone nine glaze or a cone ten glaze and it might fire an entire range or it might be totally limited to one cone and it's it's very important that when i create my glazes i let ron know what i think is going to happen so that he knows where to place the pots in the kiln rusty readies each piece of pottery for the glaze by waxing areas where no glaze is to adhere when waxing is completed, Rusty uses a combination of pouring and spraying the glaze. In this way, she coats each piece of pottery with glaze and then moves on to the final step, decorating. The way you decorate a pot, I think, is quite important. Um, we have always used a lot of flowers and leaves and wheat patterns and so on, and we've sort of made the wheat our trademark. Rusty has developed a brush technique mastered by few and envied by many. Her precision is born of years of practice, talent, and a genuine love of the art. The pieces are now ready for the final firing. When we moved out here, we built a, uh, a wood firing kiln. And Rusty and I used to go down along the river and collect all the dry, dead wood to stoke these two chambers. And it took a quart and a half of wood per firing. And uh, collecting these little scrawny bits of wood to fit the stoke hole. Well, we had that worked out really well. I got to drag everything out of the bush while Ron cut it up. <laughs> and I cut it to proper length, so my suiting. Presently, Ron is responsible for the firing of the two-chamber reduction kiln, so-called because the operator can reduce the oxygen atmosphere and produce pleasing glaze effects not possible in an electric kiln. He spends a full day loading the kiln. Because of the nature of the firing, the kiln fires hotter in certain areas than in others. It is essential that the potter understand his kiln so that a firing is successful. Therefore, special care must be taken in placing the pottery ware. Sets are together, and each glaze type is placed within the corresponding temperature range area. We did convert the first chamber, the largest chamber, into propane fire. The second chamber is still a wood fire chamber, but propane assisted. And that enables us to do the special pieces in that wood-fired chamber. Because the Corindas have opened their doors to Katimovic billets and to apprentices, often Ron is fortunate to have help, loading and bricking up the 65 and 26 cubic foot chambers. Firing a wood chamber, if anyone has the opportunity to do the whole sequence, I recommend it because it's it's man against the machine almost. And it's, it takes a real power and a fortitude to stoke and stoke. And, uh, and the challenge of beating that kiln, of mastering it, of bringing it up and seeing those cones drop, that's dynamic when that last cone goes down and you know that you've got an excellent fire in the firing of both propane and wood chambers is long and hard work, lasting 16 to 24 hours, sometimes longer. It is labor intensive, requiring a definite stoking rhythm. The firing, reaching cone 10, a temperature of approximately 1300 degrees Celsius, must not be too quick or the glazes will not mature properly. Cones, special clay bodies that are designed to melt at certain temperatures, are guides that are watched constantly. When the last cone goes down the firing, finally is stopped, and the two to three day cooling process begins. When you open that wood fire chamber, it's not only like Christmas, it's just a real, real surprise. Uh, because the unexpected kiln can do wonders for you because of the wood ash. Whereas the big chamber uh, with the propane, I call it my commercial kiln, uh, that's basically.
basically standard, and you can almost predict what's going to come out of that kiln. Unloading a kiln is an incredible experience. The potter can make knowledgeable predictions about what will happen to the ware during firing. But each firing is unique, and each finished load special. Excitement and wonder fill the air. Discussions are bent towards describing the pieces and their outcome. Surprise glazes are pondered, and reasons worked out. Satisfaction and disappointment are expressed. Eventually, the pieces are sorted accordingly and priced. Ron and Rusty package and deliver them to their retail shop in Saskatoon, Prairie Pottery. Put most of our craft toward functional things because these are the things that people will buy. They want to have them, they want to use them, and we also have to make them attractive so that they'll want to display them in their homes as well as use them. And I think it's kind of nice to know that we become a part of people's lives. That's the ultimate satisfaction, really. Ron and Rusty each spend time at their shop. They refer to it as their holiday. Each has a genuine love to meet with people. They feel it's an invaluable learning experience to talk with the public about their work. They discover how their present work is received, and they search for new ideas and methods. Sometimes they gain insight into how some piece may be improved. All information is used towards bettering their craft. This combined good business sense with craft has allowed them to grow in their field and to, most importantly, continue to survive in a cottage industry, creating something they love. The love of their lifestyle and their devotion to pottery spills over into all aspects of their life, even into entertaining friends and visitors. Yes, in fact, when company comes over in the city, you would generally sit down and have a barbecue, or you would entertain them on your back patio. But out here, what we did, or do with a lot of our company, is uh, have a raku party. As a rule, Ron and Rusty prepare raku pieces for their guests ahead of time. Rusty, hand building, and Ron, wheel throwing. The clay is specially formulated to withstand thermal shock. Raku is actually a Japanese method of firing primitively. And um, it was started by a uh, Japanese tea master. And he was designing tea implements for the tea ceremony for a Japanese emperor. When the guests arrive, the Raku party becomes a group project. Glazes are prepared indoors while a kiln is dug in the ground outdoors. The process is an immediate one as pots are glazed, fired, and cooled in an extremely rapid sequence compared to the usual. The pottery is fired to the point where the glaze appears to glisten. It is removed from the kiln with tongs and placed in a pit or pail filled with sawdust and covered with dried grass or leaves. After a short period of time, the piece is again removed with tongs and thrust into water to cool. The lustrous glaze effects develop before the onlooker's eyes. The Raku experience is one that often extends into all hours of the night. The participants acting and reacting with heightened adrenaline, unaware of exhaustion until the last piece has been cooled and critiqued. Ron and Rusty Corinda are survivors. They have chosen to be craftspeople. Their perseverance serves as inspiration for all. The road has often been a difficult one, but the rewards reaped have been great. A happy home for their son, as well as a continued opportunity to perfect a craft they cherish in a community that supports them. Just outside the door is wildflowers. Uh, there's, there's no concrete jungle out here, no asphalt. Uh, Wake up in the morning and the metal are 
tweeting along. You can hear the coyotes kayaking out on the river islands. And Peace and strength. In fact, one day we were sitting here and uh, actually saw a deer peek in our back window and had its nose pushed up against the glass. Wondered what those weird humans were doing in the living room. But, you know, so Radisson is a good community to be in.